So at the moment, it's just um, it's just going live in a bit. So I'll give you a, I'll give you a little heads up. Okay. There we are. It's gone live. Okay. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay. So if you want to present, um, Selsuk, the rest of us will mute, and you can um, essentially introduce us. Okay. Okay. So um, okay, I'm starting right right now. So for the benefit of the Turkish audience, uh, I will start with Turkish, actually. Then uh, when Dr. Uh, Martin Peacock, when you will start, um, uh, we can switch to English, actually. So yeah, I'm switching back to Turkish. Uh, merhabalar, uh, sensörlerden uygulamalara isimli webinara hoş geldiniz. Uh, burada Elektrobiosans ve Zimmer Peacock'un işbirliğiyle uh, oluşturduğumuz uh, bir webinar. Ee, bu aslında oluşturduğumuz işbirliğinin ilk webinarı. Sonrasında e, tekrardan bu webinarları görmeye devam edeceksiniz. Şimdi webinardan e, kısaca bahsedecek olursam, e, burada öncelikle elektrobiyosensin kısa bir tanıtımını gerçekleştireceğim. E, sonrasında biyosensörlere bir e, giriş yapacağız. Sonrasında e, Dr. Martin Peacock e, sensörlerden apilere ve nitras sensörlerinin vaka analizini e, konularında bilgilendirme yapacak. Daha sonra Zimmer Peacock'un Norveç'teki e, ARGE merkezinde glikoz sensörlerinin biraz tanıtımı ve sonrasında portatif cihazlarla aslında e, normal bir kolayla diyet kolu arasındaki şeker farkını ölçtüğümüz bir demonstrasyon gerçekleştireceğiz. Bunun sonunda da soru ve e, cevaplarla süreçlerimizi tamamlayacağız. Ben kısaca kendimden bahsedersem, e, kimya, ben Selçuk Urlu, kimya mühendisiyim. Yüksek lisansımı Hacettepe'de e, kimya mühendisi olarak elektrokimyasal sensör uygulamalarını gerçekleştiriyorum. Elektrobiyosensin genel müdürüyüm. Ve Zimmer Peacock'un Türkiye satış sorumlusuyum. Eksklüzif olarak, tabii elektrobiyosensi olarak. E, Elektrobiyosens olarak aslında biz Zimmer Peacock'un e, distribütörü olarak başladık. Bu bizim ilk itici gücümüz oldu. E, sonrasında tabii burada distribütör olarak sadece satış faaliyetlerini gerçekleştirmiyoruz. E, teknik altyapımız sayesinde hem Zimmer Peacock'un ürünlerinin e, implementasyonu, gerekli entegrasyonu ve işte troubleshooting gibi çalışmalarının yapılması... Hem de proje fikirlerinizin aslında çok daha hızlı bir şekilde e, fikirden hayata geçmesi konusunda da e, bütün konularda destek veriyoruz. Biz Zimmer Peacock'la birlikte aslında işte Batı e, Avrupa, Balkanlar, işte Amerika, buradan aslında buradaki dünya haritasında olmayan işte Hindistan'dan Doğu Asya'ya kadar e, birçok elektrobiyosans gibi firmadan oluşan bir komüniteyiz aslında. Hepimizin kendine ayrı özel uzmanlık alanları var. Bu uzmanlık alanlarına göre müşterilerimizin ihtiyaçlarına oradan uluslararası çözümler de getirebiliyoruz. Şimdi elektrobiyosans olarak aslında biz biraz daha screen printli sensörler dediğimiz yani serigrafik yöntemlerle geliştirilen sensörlerin ve bunlarla ilgili donanımların ee, uygulanması, hayata geçirilmesiyle ilgili e, ve geliştirilmesiyle ilgili e, çalışmalarımız var. Burada biz aslında teknoloji firmalarını, e, burada aslında hem teknoloji firmaları hem de akademisyenler olarak iki ana ayrı pazarımız olduğunu görüyoruz. Teknoloji firmalarında kendi arasında aslında yazılım ve donanım firmaları ve işte biyoloji ve kimya firmaları olarak ikiye ayırıyoruz. E, burada yazılım ve donanım firmalarını e, Burada amaçlarında yönelik sensörlerin geliştirilmesi ve üretilmesi ve hizmetlerine sunulması. Yani bu firmalar benim sensörüm nasıl çalışacak da çok ilgilenmeyip ham madde olarak sensörü satın alabiliyorlar bizden. Burada örnek veriyorum işte oksijen sensörü olabilir, glikoz sensörü olabilir. Bunun gibi uygulamalarına özel hangi sensörü isterlerse custom olarak zaten üretimi gerçekleştirilebiliyor. Diğer taraftan işte kimya ve biyoloji tamamlı firmalara ise biz biraz daha donanım, yazılım, işte gerekli entegrasyonların yapılması, sistemlerin yönetiminde destek veriyoruz. Bu, bu tabii buradaki ürünleri de satışını gerçekleştiriyoruz. Akademisyenlerimize bakarsak eğer, akademisyenlerimiz genellikle bir sensöre dönüştürülmemiş, hazır modifiye edilmemiş elektrotları alıp kendi sensörlerini geliştiren projeler geliştiriyorlar. 
Dolayısıyla biz burada hem veri analizleri için farklı platformlar sağlıyoruz. Burada farklı destekler de sağlıyoruz. Ve buradaki modifiye edilmemiş sensörlerin satışını gerçekleştirebiliyoruz. Elektrobiyo sensör olarak bizim bir tık daha uzmanlığa döndüğümüz konu burada sensörlerde kullanılan reseptörlerin sentezlenmesi ve üretilmesi. Biz burada hayvan zulmü içeren ve eski teknoloji olan antikorlar yerine antikor ekolilerde üretebilen antikor fragmenti ve aptamer reseptörleri üzerine çalışmalarımız var. Şimdi biosensörlere gelirsek tanımsal olarak biosensörler ortamda bulunan biyolojik numunelere karşı seçici özellik gösteren Numunelerin yapı ve yoğunluk bilgilerini ölçebilir ve işlenebilir sinyale dönüştüren analitik cihazlardır. Aslında burada bizim konuştuğumuz elektrokimyasal elektro, e, sensörlerde ise bu aslında elektronik sinyale dönüştüren analitik cihazlar diyebiliriz. Dolayısıyla elektrokimyasal sensörler biosensörlerin bir alt dalı oluyor. E, biosensörlerde genellikle sıvı tabanlı ölçümler gerçekleştiriliyor. Tabii ki bunun gazlarda ve katı tabanlı ölçümleri var ama genellikle sıvı tabanlı ölçümler oluyor ve bu sıvının içerisinde analit dediğimiz bizim aslında hedef bileşenimiz oluyor. Biz bu hedef bileşeni bir reseptör vasıtasıyla seçici olarak tanıyoruz. Bu bir enzim olabilir, bir protein olabilir. Bu bir, burada aslında burada reaksiyona giren farklı bir element de olabilir. Bunun sadece önemli olan kısmı bizim kompleks karışık bir çözelti içerisinde seçici olarak hedefimizi tanıyabilmesi. Daha sonra bizim burada sinyal çevirici ismini verdiğimiz buradaki veriyi aslında alıp çevirip okunabilir bir hale getiren ve arttırıcıyla arttıran ve ölçülebilir bir hale getiren, anlamlandırılabilir bir hale getiren bir sisteme sahip olmamız. Yine kısaca elektrokimyasal sensörlerde bu verinin işte kimyasal bir reaksiyondan alınan verinin elektronik bir sinyala çevrilmesi, arttırılması ve sensör verisinin elde edilmesi olabilir. Peki bunlar nerelerde ölçümler yapılıyor dersek en genel kullanım alanları işte idrar kan gibi medikal ölçümler olabilir. Burada en çok aslında markette en büyük yere sahip olan şey parmaktan alınan kan örneğinden şeker ölçümü yapan diyabet hastalarıdır. Yani bu sektörde en çok tanınan teknoloji ürünü budur. E, aynı zamanda burada tabi Gıdalarda örnek veriyorum sütlerdeki toksin ya da farklı gıdalardaki işte pestisit analizleri olabilir. Gerekli içerisindeki madde miktarı analizleri olabilir. Türkiye'de aslında biraz daha meşhur olan helallik analizleri olabilir. Bunun dışında, bunun dışında da çevresel analizler burada mümkün. Doğadaki çevresel analizler ve tarım sularındaki yapılan analizler diyebiliriz. Biosensörlerle peki biz neleri ölçebiliyoruz dersek aslında en başta en küçük olan iyonları ölçebiliyoruz. Bunların en çok kullanılan bilinen e, örnekleri pH sensörleri aslında ama e, biz pH sensörlerinin dışında e, bir solventli ya da bir sıvının içerisinde e, hazırda bulunan işte klor, e, sodyum, brom gibi iyonları ayrı ayrı konsantrasyonlarını ölçebiliyoruz. Bunun dışında küçük moleküller var. Bu moleküller işte toksin olabilir. Az önce örnekte verdiğim gibi glikoz olabilir. Küçük molekülleri de algılayabilecek sistemlerimiz var. Bununla beraber genetik yapıları da bu sensörlerle algılayabiliyoruz. Yani burada RNA, DNA gibi yapıları algılayabiliyoruz. Hatta bu teknoloji o kadar gelişmiş durumda ki bir çözelti içerisindeki bir mikroorganizmanın türünün tespit edilmesini bile bu DNA, yanızı, DNA sensörleriyle gerçekleştirebiliriz. Bununla birlikte aslında son zamanlarda çok meşhur olan patojen tespitleri de var. Burada e, Zimmer Peacock ve Elektrobiosensin kardeş firması olan işte Alexir isimli bir firma aslında COVID-19 e, analizi yapan e, sensörleri de elektrokimyasal sensörleri geliştirmektedir. E, serigrafik sensörlerin yapısını çok basit temel anlamda anlatacak olursak e, burada gördüğünüz gibi aslında elektrotlar yani buradaki sensör üzerinde elektrotlarımız var ve buradaki işlemler yani buradaki veriler bu elektrotların aslında gerçekleşen olaylardan alınan veriler oluyor. E, potansiyostat dediğimiz cihaz ise aslında bu elektroda farklı akımlar ya da farklı gerilimler uygulayan bir cihaz. Ve bu akımlar ve gerilimler sonucunda elde edilen yansımaları da hassas bir şekilde ölçüp değerlendirebilen cihazlar. Burada baktığımız zaman çok temel, çok basit anlamda anlatırsak, burada tabii ki potansiyostatlar farklı 
e, gerilim patenleri, akım patenleri e, uygulayabiliyorlar. Ama çok temelde anlatacak olursak, bildiğiniz gibi akım aslında elektronların taşınmasıyla gerçekleşiyor. Potansiyostat buraya bir gerim uyguladığında, bir işlem uyguladığında, eğer bizim biz de burada çalışma elektronunda e, ilgili hedef yani çalışma elektronu dediğimiz kısım e, ilgili hedef analitimizle reaksiyona girebilecek kısım. Biz burayı kimyası olarak modifiye ediyoruz. Sonrasında potansiyostattan ilgili işlem uygulandığı zaman eğer hedef bileşenimiz bir çözelti içerisindeyse yani burada bu e, şeyimizin damlatıldığı ya da batırıldığı, bu sensörümüzün batırıldığı çözelti içerisinde hedef bileşenimiz varsa burada bir reaksiyon oluşuyor ve bu reaksiyon sonucunda burada bir elektron oluşuyor. Biz buradan bu oluşan elektron miktarını potansiyostattan tekrar ölçümünü gerçekleştirebiliyoruz. Bu da ne demek oluyor? Biz burada hem hedef bileşenimizin e, orada olup olmadığını anlıyoruz hem de orada elde edilen elektron aktarımı miktarından da konsantrasyon ölçümlerini yaparak potansiyostatın arayüzünden ölçümlerimizi yapabiliyoruz. Burada gördüğünüz gibi aslında potansiyostatların eski halleri bir masanın üzerine konulabilecek koca sistemleri olmasına rağmen artık teknolojinin gelişmesiyle birlikte Zimur Peacock'un ürünü de avcumuzun içine sığabilecek hale gelmiş durumdadır. Burada çok kısa yine... Örneklerimizi gösterecek olursak, bakın buradaki potansiyostat aslında 3 cm, 2 cm'lik çok kısa, küçük bir potansiyostat. Ve biz burada örnek çözeltimize bunu daldırdığımız zaman, e, buradaki yüzeyde az önce anlattığım gibi kimyasal olarak modifiye edilmiş sistemler, reaksiyon sistemleri, burada bir iminosensör var, yani bir enzim substrat ilişkisi gibi birbirine bağlanan bir sistem e, planlanmış. Hedef bileşen olması durumunda, hedef bileşenimiz burada ilgili yere oturuyor ve burada bir sinyal oluşturuyor. Dolayısıyla aslında teknolojinin güzel tarafı şu, artık bunları sadece bu tarz cihazlardan hani uzmanların okuyabileceği verileri anlayacak şekilde değil, artık bunları mobil uygulamaları da bağlayabiliyoruz ve mobil uygulamalarla her firma kendi uygulamasını kendi istediği şekilde manipüle ederek pazara çıkabiliyor. Ben dinlediğiniz için için çok teşekkür ederim. Şimdi konuşma sürecini Sayın Doktor Martin Peacock devam edecek. Burada sensörlerden apiler kısmına devam edeceğiz. Paylaşmayı durduruyorum. Martin, you can continue to the webinar. I'm done with the Turkish introduction. Yeah, no sweat. Thanks very much. Yeah, I, um, I was glad to say I, I think I followed 50% of it. So it's good to see that science is an international language. So um, thank you very much. I will just share my screen. Um, if you just give me some confirmation that you can see it, that'd be great. Um, yeah, I can see it. So you can see it. Brilliant. Okay, great. So um, yeah, well, thanks for the... Um, for sort of opening us up as you say you know we're doing this specifically today for our kind of colleagues um in turkey um but of course you know um we support people across the globe so i'm going to just start my stopwatch so i don't go too long i'm just going to give you a quick um agenda everyone um so we've had an introduction um from um Sherlock, and i'm going to give you a quick introduction to zimmer and peacock it's only going to be 10 minutes and i've got a stopwatch going so we won't overrun Um, we're going to talk about sensors to API. So we're sort of getting a sense that some people are very interested in um, the biosensor itself, but some people who are like developing IoT type applications, um, they don't want to so much handle a biosensor. They actually just want the data stream or they just want the data itself. And I think one of the things that's not well understood about biosensors is that less than half the problem is the biosensor. Um, a big part of it is actually the mathematics and converting biosensor signal into something that's meaningful. Um, so we're going to talk about from sensor to API today. Um, and then we're also going to do a practical demonstration on um, Coca-Cola. So I'm um, hopefully, not hopefully, but I've got a, we've got a couple of colleagues online. They're kind of hiding at the moment, but they're going to do a demonstration from um, our lab in Norway. So I suppose you're getting a real international um, webinar today because um, I happen to be sitting in our new lab um, in the UK. There's a lab behind the glass there. The guys who are going to give the demonstration are doing it from our facility in um, Norway. 
and obviously we're also coming to you from um, Turkey today, so it's um, it's fairly international. And then, as I say, we're, we're going to do a practical demonstration um, measuring Coca-Cola on the um, on the phone. Now, one brave person um, has asked us that she's particularly interested in diabetes, um, and so. If you if you in the chat start listing out things that you're interested in, you can use the YouTube chat to kind of ask questions. So if you say something and, and we see it, we will um, address your questions. So just an introduction to Zero Peacock. It'll be fast. Um, I'm sure you don't want to hear too much about us. We can um, whoops a daisy. Uh, yeah, give me a second. My slides are just. Right. right, introduction to Zimmer Peacock. The, the first slide I have here is, um, is um, it has a picture of myself on it. And it's just really just to kind of say that my name is Martin Peacock. I'm one of the um, founders at um, Zimmer and Peacock. I happen to be a chemist by training, um, an electrochemist by um, sort of PhD. Um, I've spent some time at GSK, which is um, making drugs. Um, for medicinal purposes, and also I was at Abbott Diabetes. A lot of my kind of entrepreneurial skills um, come from California, where I was, where I lived for six years. And my and the motivation really is just to get science onto the market. And I think that makes us very different as a technology company. We're not so much in, you know, the technology is a means to an end. We really want to get people onto the market, and that's um, the sort of driving philosophy on us. The business was launched in two thousand and fourteen. We're ISO 13485, and that's significant because it means that the products that come from us can be medical grade and used for the diagnosis of diseases in human beings because we are ISO 13485. We have three labs in the UK, one of them's behind me, um, four facilities in Norway. The biggest facility in Norway is 4,000 square meters. So um, it, it's not big and it's certainly not small. Uh, and as I say, we're ISO 13485. We're very relevant. This is a technology um, that's on the market for detecting COVID-19 on the breath. So it's not, you know, and, and, and more importantly, this is not a technology that's kind of on paper. It's literally being used um, in Italian hospitals, for example, to screen whether somebody has COVID-19 or not. And when you were looking at some of Celsic's um, slides, he was showing what we essentially call immunosensors, the binding of you have a macromolecule and something binds to it, and that's the source of the signal. And that's what we're doing on the COVID-19 um, sensor. So um, it is relevant what we're doing, and we are able to get things onto the market. So just find us on LinkedIn if, you, if you're interested in kind of interacting with us. Um, you'll also find us on ResearchGate if you're um, into the academic community. We've got very strong relationships with a number of universities. Um, Oxford University is probably worth a mention, um, but we do have a lot of these, um, um, let's say, key ties to um, universities. So if you want to know about Zimmer and Peacock, this is our website, um, zimmerpeacock.com. Follow us on social media. You'll find um, you know, that, that we do a lot of updates all the time. If you're not sure about fire sensors and some of what we're talking about today is not clear to you, Join the ZP Academy, because on the ZP Academy, there are two um, courses, one introduction to biosensors. The nice thing about it is free. And we also have a um, course on electrochemical techniques for biosensor developers. This is also free as well. So it, um, you just have to, you, you can look at those and just get a sense of the science that we are doing at Zimmer Peacock, but you're not, um, it's just informative. And then we also have something called the ZP Developer Zone, where we try and help um, entrepreneurs and startups with their um, development. And that has its own website as well. Just to kick into um, sensors, so Zimmer and Peacock, we probably have the largest range of biosensors on the market. So I'm going to go quite quickly. And as I go, I will describe what they could be used for. So the grandfather of, of many biosensors is the glucose biosensor. Um, so at Zimmer and Peacock, we have um, many glucose sensors uh, for type 1 diabetics, type 2 diabetics, they could be used in food monitoring. But glucose sensing is something that's um, fairly at the heart of us at Zimmer and Peacock. We have oxygen sensors. So for, if you want to monitor the oxygen concentration in blood or water, we have oxygen sensors. 
Lactate sensors are very interesting to people who are trying to do maybe monitoring cells in cell tissue or trying to measure, measure the exertion of athletes. So lactate sensors are very um, interesting. Hydrogen peroxide is something that some people want to detect on the breath but for um, looking at diseases of the lungs. The pH sensor, this is not your normal glass pH sensor. This is a solid state pH sensor and pH is the most monitored chemical parameter in the world. So if you're thinking about an IoT application and you're wondering, well, you know, what should I measure? pH is the most measured electric, electrical, sorry, chemical parameter in the world. Chloride is very interesting for things like cystic fibrosis. Potassium is very um, important for um, if somebody's got um, uh, potassium levels that are high, it could be a, a, a sign of um, kidney problems. People on dialysis have to be very careful of monitoring their uh, potassium. We have calcium sensors, we have alcohol sensors, we have nitrate sensors, and we will give a, um, a bit of a case study on nitrate sensors today. Nitric oxide, ammonium, which ammonium also kicks into agriculture, uric acid sensors, which are linked with bacteria and um, infections, sodium sensors, one of the sodium is very important in the food industry and is also very important in um, blood monitoring. We have phosphate sensors, which are useful for agricultural applications. Sulfite is used a lot in food preserv um, yeah, preservation. Redox sensors, these are for measuring the oxidative stress of things. Ketone sensors are becoming very interesting to people who are interested in monitoring diet or monitoring diabetics. Salinity can be used for monitoring either hydration or monitoring water. And now I'm going to go a bit faster. CGM, continuous glucose monitoring, we will touch upon that today. Many sensors use enzymes called dehydrogenases, so we have sensors that work with those. And finally, fructose, cortisol sensor. Cortisol um, is very interesting to people making wearable sensors. And then finally, purine sensors, which is for measuring things like stroke, um, epilepsy, and um, bacterial things. So. I'll just check the um, the questions. No, that's cool. So what I will do now is go uh, to go down. So I think if I was to summarize this, we have a lot of sensors, and there's many applications that um, can be explored using these sensors. Just to give you a sense of our facility, um, this is the 4,000 square meter facility in Norway. Um, if you ever come and visit us, then you're going to find a very kind of professional area where everyone's gowned up and everyone's keeping um, clean. Um, this is kind of pictures within the um, lab setting. And then we have um, um, other labs now, as I say, in Coventry and Wolverhampton, the UK. So that's the end of the introduction. I, want, I was speaking very fast because I didn't want to take up essentially precious time. Um, we're talking too much about us. So that was nine minutes and 41 seconds. So if you've got any questions, put them into the chat. Um, on um, on the YouTube chat. So now I'm going to talk about um, sensors to um, API. So first of all, I want to talk about this is the workflow at Zimmer and Peacock. So if you came to us and said, um, I, I want to make a new sensor for something that we don't know about, we would probably have to develop the sensor with you. We would probably have to make the microfluidics. Now, What's good is that we have technologies in place, like we can put QR codes onto sensors. So, you know, we can carry information with the sensor into the field quite readily. And obviously, we also have electronics, so that, you know, the electronics were presented earlier on. So these kind of sensors, um, they're fairly small. They plug into the front of these boxes. And part of the next, part of the workflow is we often make apps. Um, and so, you know, the, tech, the conversation that we're having today is only possible because um, sensing manufacturing technology has got pretty good. So at Zimmer Peacock, we started off being a sensor manufacturer. So that's, that's part of the puzzle. Another part of the puzzle is um, actually low-cost electronics. So low-cost electronics are now possible. The other part of the puzzle is smartphones, you know, weren't around but you know 10 years ago they you know they they were around but 15 years ago they were really just emerging a bit so smartphones are very useful because then the smartphone in our platform 
This is a platform that we have. We have sensors, we have electronics, and we're able to make apps. Now, the way the electronics work is the app will connect to the meter by um, Bluetooth, and the meter will collect the data, and then the data will be transmitted back to the app. So if you were in a program with us, the app then, would you'd, you could then hit upload, and essentially then it would um, send the data to the cloud. So at Zimmer Peacock, we have something called um, Julie. Julie is a cloud database, and um, it will send the raw data to the cloud. So, you know, keywords here, you know, sensors, electronics, apps, and cloud. And so we have this infrastructure already existing at Zimmer and Peacock. And so what we're, um, we're what, what, one of the things we, we're expecting is that people will actually then be able to access, let's say, the sensor data using um, an application program interface, an API. So if you're an Internet of Things developer and you don't want to, you know, you don't want to manufacture the sensor, you don't want to manufacture the electronics, but you're quite happy to receive the data from these sensors, then you can basically use an API um, to, to talk to our database, or you can log in and, and get the data that way. Now, the reason that we have this workflow is we're quite used to working with academics and startups. And so the sensor's really in development. So what, what we're expecting to happen is this. We're expecting that we're going to get some um, raw signal, which is electrochemical in nature, and would be proportional to the raw signal is proportional to the analyte of interest that you're trying to measure. And we're expecting to use a data scientist team to look at features in that data. Because what we want to do is we want to come up with the best algorithm for looking so the signal is proportional to these features. So we want to find the best signal possible looking at the features. But what we need with these collaborations is we need um, the, the other data. What I mean by the other data, the labels. So if you're doing a, um, a nitrate sensor for soil, then there's other ways of measuring nitrate. And so we need to know those other ways, what the results of those other ways are. If you're doing a medical diagnostic, Often, you will have a sample of blood that can be tested by the biosensor and can be tested in the central laboratory. So we want to know the results from the central laboratory as well, because essentially then what we're trying to do is we're trying to match the clinical value with the biosensor value and come up with the best correlation between clinical and bio. So at Zimmer and Peacock, we kind of, we can work with people on several parts of this workflow. The workflow is designed to accelerate people's development time, and it accelerates it by allowing a biosensor to be developed, and for a biosensor to very quickly be able to go into the hands of a farmer or food technologist or a clinician, like a doctor, and to start testing with real samples. But what we then try to do is look at the raw data versus um, the medical data or the food or the food uh, data or the agricultural data and come up with an algorithm to that best or model that best correlates the biosensor value with the clinical value. So at which point then the model gets better and better, so we're in an essentially a learning phase, and eventually we have a very strong um, essentially AI model, or artificial intelligence model for um, getting the raw signal, converting the raw signal into the real concentration, and then the real concentration can be pulled out um, and into people's third party um, applications using the API. So this workflow is one of the hearts of what we're doing. Now, if anyone's got any questions about that, um, I'd be happy to kind of answer them. You can put them in the chat. What I'm now going to do is I'm going to talk um, about two applications. One of them's on agriculture, and the other one's uh, much more medical related. So let me talk about agriculture to start with. 
So the problem that we're going to talk about is nitrate fertilizers. Similar problems exist. I know in Turkey, there's a lot of interest among academic groups on looking at pesticides. Um, so the story I'm telling you could be very similar for pesticides, but today I'm going to talk about nitrate um, fertilizers. So this is the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, the farmer obviously wants the best possible crop he can, so therefore he's adding nitrate fertilizers um, to the um, to the soil. Um, these nitrates are intended to get into the roots um, of the plants. But the problem is because nobody is monitoring how much nitrate is added, nobody really, really knows how much nitrate is in the soil. And because of that, they're essentially overdosing the nitrate and it's ending up running off into the water courses. So the problem is it, it gets both into the rivers, but it also gets into the groundwater. And also, if you over fertilize it, it just gets eaten by bacteria and releases nitrogen back to the atmosphere. So the problem is here is there is no nitrate sensor in the soil, and therefore the farmer has no real way of knowing how much nitrate to add to the soil. So what does he do? He just keeps on adding it um, because he, he really has no um, sort of guidance um, on this at all. So what I will do now is, uh, so, the, so the solution is, is to um, actually have a nitrate sensor in the soil. So that's what we're working on. Um, and of course, it fits in with my with the ZP accelerator platform because we need telemetry. We need to be able to get the signal off the sensor and really to the sort of to the farmer's smartphone. So I showed a workflow earlier on which I call ZP accelerator. This is a very different form factor, but actually the workflow is the same. You know, there's a sensor here, there's electronics here, there's connectivity, there's a cloud database. But now the application is very specific. We're trying to monitor the nitrate in soil. So just a background to the nitrate sensor. I said, um, if there's any um, academics um, listening in today, you might find us very interesting. But the original idea for this came from a, an academic in the UK called um, Tony Miller at the John Inn Center. I saw him give a talk on nitrate sensing, and I saw his original nitrate sensors. And they were essentially sort of lab-made um, nitrate sensors. But you know, I thought this was very interesting technology. And I saw his lecture, and essentially he was putting these little nitrate sensors into the soil. So they looked promising, but I could also see that they were they looked very fragile and um, not very robust. So you know, from a sort of um, from an industrial perspective, I knew that they would you know they'd have to be improved. But we had a simple idea, which was to take his idea and essentially make it into a solid state um, center. So we, we haven't mentioned, I haven't mentioned today that all the word screen printed electrode, but Zimmer and Peacock were probably the manufacturers of the world's best screen printed electrodes in terms of cost, repeatability, quality. So we make a lot of screen printed electrodes. So what we did is we said, we like this idea of a nitrate soil sensor, but it needs to be robust and low cost. So we were able to take the science that they'd done at the university and put it onto a um, sensor. So now I'm gonna talk about where we are today. So where we are today is, this is the nitrate rod. Um, as this video plays, in a bit, I'll just bring my mouse to it. There's some little red squares um, here and here. That's where the nitrate sensors actually are. So it gives you a sense of, look at all the engineering that's had to go into place just to be able to place two nitrate sensors in the soil. And that's because we're trying to place these nitrate sensors at a depth of 30 centimeters and 60 centimeters. So it gives you a real sense of how much engineering it's taken to be able to put nitrate sensors in the soil at the right depth and then give them the telemetry so that we can actually get the um, signal out again. So what I'll do is I'll just um, click down slightly. So these are the sensors themselves. Um, this is um, These are the engineers and the project manager, Niti, who um, man manufactured these first sensors. So you can see that you know, they're fairly big 
just to deliver these tiny little sensors into the soul. But that's how hard this kind of application is, where you know, you've got to make something that's robust for something like six months or nine months. It takes a lot of engineering and a lot of hard work to do something like that. So this is the sensor itself, and as I say, it has to deliver these little sensors into the soil um, at a sort of depth of 30 and 60 centimeters. There they are. And of course, we're all about um, the Internet of Things, and you know, so therefore, it's been designed to connect to a base station and send the data to the cloud. So I would just uh, click a little bit. So the idea is there's lots of these sensors in the in the field and they're all sending their data to the cloud and then we're able to see the see how the nitrate changes as a function of time now where we are at the moment is there are sort of two products there's um a rod we call it um it's not very inspired but we call it the nitrate rods at the moment and we also have the module um now we haven't talked at all about what type of sensors these are. These are what they call um, potentiometric sensors. Um, and what that means is we essentially have to just measure the voltage between two um, wires. So the sensor itself is potentiometric, um, and we have to design electronics that can both read this voltage and then transmit it to the cloud. Um, and we have some information on the web about that. These are just some pictures from our testing. Um, you can see that we've, you know, in order to make a nitrate sensor, um, it has to be fairly robust if it's going to be in the soil for six to nine months. So we've got these sensors submerged under water to make sure that the water doesn't sort of get into the sensor and cause um, shorts. So that's why we're um, running it like that. And, um, oops, Daisy. So this little video here. Um, it's not only the sensors that have to be able to resist water, but in this video, we've actually got the electronics in the box, and the guys have been, you know, essentially putting a weight on it and put it underwater to make sure it's robust enough. So I think that's a sort of, you know, the challenges of agricultural sensors and making the Internet of Things for agricultural needs can sometimes be that, you know, the system has to be so robust. You know, it's one thing to make electronics, but it's another thing to make sure that the housing can withstand being submerged under water. Um, so I just want to kind of, you know, emphasize these things are not um, necessarily super easy. Um, I make them, we make them sound easy when we talk about them, but no, there's a lot of engineering has gone into this. Obviously, to make sure that it worked, um, we dug a hole in the garden, we covered it up, and then we monitored the sensors and we, um, on occasions, added nitrate to the sensors to make sure that they responded, So, and, and they did. So now, um, after that, then we took the sensors to, um, to a field in the UK, and um, we planted them in the soil, and you know, essentially we've left them there. So I just want to give you a sense, um, and that's the, one of the sensors itself with its, um, it has to have a, um, a solar cell on it because it needs to be powered. Now I'm going to talk about the data, because I know that the only question that's come through at the moment is really about continuous glucose monitoring and diabetes. But the conversation I'm about to have does have some relevance to that. And the, and the reason of being is this. So we take this nitrate sensor, and we, we know exactly where it is. This is the beauty of sort of IoT-type applications. We know exactly where it is, and this is what the data looks like. Now, this is nitrate data, but... It can be a similar story sometimes with diabetes and monitoring um, patients. You know, the data is very confusing, and that's why um, data science and AI is super useful because it can help people understand complexity. So let me let me tell you a story about what we're looking at here. Don't forget, there's an electrochemical biosensor at the heart of this. This one happens to be a nitrate sensor, and the story is this. So. On this day, on the um, I'll just go back one. On the twenty, no, sorry, on the third, no, on the thirtieth of March, twenty twenty-one. So on the thirtieth of March, twenty twenty-one, we had a whole bunch of sensors, nitrate sensors, sitting in the soil. So this is their data here. It's um, this blue and this um, uh, the blue and the green, and we added nitrate to the soil here. Now. 
the nitrate was going along quite happily um, and steadily, um, and we added nitrate. Now, what you're going to notice in a minute is the nitrate is actually going downwards. And this is the power of continuous monitoring, having connectivity with sensors, having you know, cloud databases, because the farmer does, have no, does not know this. He doesn't know that the fact is he had stable nitrate, he's added nitrate, and yet the nitrate is still tracking downwards. Now, you might ask yourself, why is it tracking downwards? And the reason it's tracking downwards is because the soil is drying out. We actually have soil moisture being um, monitored as well at the, at, at the same time. And so he's adding nitrate to the soil, but because the soil is dry and drying out, he's actually getting no benefit of the nitrate. Now, the next thing that happens is it rains. And because it rains, the nitrate shoots up. And now the farmer, because he doesn't have the ability to understand real-time data, he, he just goes up ahead and adds more nitrate to the soil, which causes a bit more of an increase. But essentially, he thinks that he's added nitrate on the 30th of March, and then he thinks he's added a second dose of nitrate on about the 30th of May. But in fact, the 30th of March had very little impact because the soil was drying out. So essentially, he's added the two lots of nitrate back to back. The analogy with with the medical field would be would be a diabetic, a type one diabetic who didn't really have a, a good understanding of their glucose level, who added two doses of um, let's say insulin at the same time, and so gave themselves twice as much insulin as they needed. But in this application, the farmers essentially added twice as much nitrate as he was expecting, because the soil was so dry he didn't get the benefit of the original dosage. Now all the time it's raining. And then he adds some more nitrate. But in fact, the ground actually dries out really quickly and the nitrate goes down. So the third dosage, he's not really getting the benefit of that until it in fact rains again and then the nitrate goes up again. So what this means is this farmer is probably added, um, he should have only added one dose of nitrate and he's in fact added three doses of nitrate. Now, with the system that we've given, we were able to give them, he could have actually reduced his nitrate usage by 66% and not only saved himself some money, but also then saved the possibility of um, causing um, pollution in the local water courses. So this possibly, this case scenario already sort of answers the question, why should anyone be interested in putting sensor data to the cloud? And it's because when you look at the when you look at scenarios like this, you can both save money and save the environment. So I will just um, now, if anyone's got any questions, um, just put them into the sort of YouTube um, chat. But I just want to say something about this nitrate sensor. Um, there's a website about it called ZP Ag Tech. You're welcome to look at that. Um, at the moment, it's going through beta testers with us, you know, real people in the real world. Um, it is free to get hold of these nitrate sensors, but if you're in Turkey and you want to get hold of it, then you have to you have to contact Selçuk and go through him. Um, but yeah, it's it's out there. I'm going to slightly change gear now and just talk about aquaculture very quickly. But whilst talking about aquaculture, I'm actually going to talk about continuous glucose monitoring. As I say, any questions, put your hands up in the chat, and um, I'll definitely try and um, answer it. So. Let me talk about aquaculture. So what I'm going to talk about here is um, people, well, a very important source of protein for the world is going to be um, aquaculture, and that's sort of, you know, fish farms. So, uh, but in fish farms, the, 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 there's a high um, morbidity. A lot of the fish die before they can actually make it to the market. And that's because the fish um, are stressed, um, they're getting diseases. So at Zimmer and Peacock, we've been tasked with making a, uh, a a sensor for continuously measuring the cortisol in fish and continuously measuring the glucose in fish. Um, and let me just kind of what does so if we're going to do that, what does that um, what does that consist of doing? That consists of we have a fish, 
We have stress biomarkers. So glucose is not a bad marker for the, knowing the health of fish. And cortisol is a good um, marker for knowing the stress of fish. It requires the electronics. And we talked about electronics earlier on. And it also re requires connectivity to the cloud so that we can kind of collect and monitor the data. So I'll just give you a quick um, summary of where this is at. So in terms of the glucose sensor at Zimmer and Peacock, we have lots of glucose sensors. Um, we've been doing this for, you know, for a very long time. And we've been monitoring these glucose sensors for um, several months. At this point, we think, I think we have a, a, a sensor that's actually been continuous, in continuous operation now for six months. So if anyone asks you how long a CGM um, could last for, it depends on the application. And um, I realize I'm going to have to go a bit faster than this. I am going to go faster. Um, so, yeah, we make CGMs. Um, they work. Um, this is just to give you a sense of the size of the electronics. They're pretty small. This is the package that we work with. Um, now, I could give you a long introduction to electrochemical um, glucose sensors. Um, if you want to know about um, electrochemical glucose sensors and how they work, then I'm happy to do it through um, we have something called the ZP developer zone. I'm happy to give a kind of detailed introduction to that. But because of today's um, timelines, I'm not going to. I'm going to um, actually say, if you want more information about CG um, biosensors, look at the, um, the academy. And then we're going to go to a quick demo in Norway. So you have to work with us slightly whilst we just do a handover from myself um, to, the, to the team in Norway. So, Mats, you there? Yeah, I think you're on mute at the moment. Yeah, cool. All right. All right. So, what I'll do, I'll, I'll just do a quick introduction. So, um, Solrun and Mats are in Norway. Um, I'm going to mute my mic, which will then, uh, and Solrun's going to do a quick demonstration of um, some pretty cool technology. So, Solrun, let me silence myself and just give the guys a quick introduction to what's going on. Yeah, start. Okay. <laughs> so, um, my name is Solren, as Martin said, and I'm a scientist here at Simran Peacock. And today I will demonstrate for you how to detect glucose in Coca Cola uh, versus uh, Coca Cola Zero, which doesn't contain glucose. So, we will uh, use the Sensus Smart from Palmses, and we will insert it into our phone and access the PS Touch app that you can download from the App Store. Um, we will use the glucose sensor kit from Simmer and Peacock. Um, here are two calibration solutions and several sensors, glucose sensors. So we will insert that into the Sensus Smart and we will make sure it aligns with the lines here, like that. And next up, we will go to method, where we will choose chronoamperometry, and we will change the range so that it's max uh, 32 microamperes. And we will set the voltage to 0 0.65. And we will run it for 600 seconds. We can just stop that if we don't want to run it for that long. Okay, we will start with a Coca-Cola Zero, which is not supposed to contain glucose. And then we will hit start. Okay, so here you see that a typical chronoamperometric curve is forming. So in the beginning, there's um, a, a double layer um, forming and some diffusion. And uh, what you see here is that it's forming a baseline, and that's when um, you have um, uh, equilibrity. Um, and uh, you would maybe expect that for Coca-Cola Zero, the current will be zero, but there's still it still works as an electrolyte, so there's still current there. And um, now we will swap solutions for Coca-Cola that contains glucose. And we'll see what that does with our experiments. Okay, so it, it has a small dip when I take it out of the 
the solution. But what you can see here is that it clearly um, uh, increases, the current clearly increases, and now it's slowly uh, stabilizing. Uh, and so we can actually see a clear step that this has uh, glucose compared to the Coca-Cola Zero. Eventually, this line will also like start to drop, but that's just a depletion of the glucose on the, on the electrode. So we will just keep it running and we'll go back to Martin for a Q&A. Yeah, so, um, well, f f thank you, Sol Runner Motz. That was, um, that was a very sweet um, demonstration. So it does, it does demonstrate really the power of, you know, biosensors. The fact is, you know, the potential stats that CellSuck introduced and then we've just shown you is tiny. It plugs straight to the phone, so it gets all its power off the phone. And because obviously, you know, the data's on the phone, you can, you can imagine now the connectivity back to the cloud. You know, and look at that beautiful data. That's a very strong signal because what's happening is we started in Coca-Cola zero, so no glucose. We went across to um, real Coca-Cola, which unfortunately is full of sugar. Um, and then the sensor responded accordingly and the, and the signal went um, straight up. So um, if people have questions, you're um, very welcome to answer them, um, ask them rather. But CellSec, I mean, we've obviously, we went very fast. There was a lot of content there. Um, you know, there was a demonstration, there was a nitrate sensor, there was the, you know, sensor for fish, and now Solvent's done this. Um, what were your thoughts, um, you know, on this? Was that, was this, um, I'd just love to hear your feedback. Um, okay, uh, it's actually, it was really good. It was actually um, mind opening, I guess, uh, because we actually, um, check a lot of boxes uh, during the webinar. So um, if it, uh, there was actually some students uh, in our audience. So I hope it will be uh, very helpful for them to uh, imagine how they can do, what they can do with the biosensors. And for, um, I guess for software engineers or software companies, it was nice to see the sensors, sensors, the API. Um, actually a uh, presentation it was actually it was uh, very uh, good for me as well i really like this um, the technology behind the, these sensors because it seems like so simple there's a one sensor one potential stat but there's a lot of work behind it actually uh, it was kind of nice to uh, show our audience that how what kind of work they need to do or what kind of they need to outsource from us um, so yeah, it was, I guess, it was really a nice uh, presentation, actually. So um, I suppose, you know, what, what we could do is, I'm, I'm just looking to see if there are any questions, but I didn't, I didn't, see, okay. um, I didn't see many yeah. questions there. But I may, okay. maybe I could ask, um, ask you a question, which is, you know, if people are interested, there we are. So what, there's one question that's come through. For, um, can Sue, if you want to type your question, then um, We'll try and answer it now. So we did have one question, but um, if it comes through, then we will um, answer it. What is the question? Um, but then I was going to say that what we can do is, yeah, you could also tell people how to contact you. And I know that you've, you've reached out to most people, but I think it's very important that people understand that in Turkey, you know, you're there. You know, you have a, a very strong background in this. You've been learning about biosensors for easily two years now. I know you've been sort of following us for a year and, and working with us for a year. So how do they contact you? Yeah, um, OK. Uh, maybe I can make like a Turkish uh, explanation. Maybe it will be better to because I yeah, will sure. explain. Yeah, OK. Merhabalar uh, tekrardan uh, elektrobiyosens olarak aslında Tepe Prime'da uh, yerimiz. Ankara uh, merkezdeyiz. E, lokasyonumuz aslında birkaç hafta içerisinde değişmek üzere ama yine de e, www.elektrobiosens.com adresinden bize ulaşabilirsiniz. E, Selçuk Uğurlu tekrardan benim adım. LinkedIn üzerinden de beni takip edebilirsiniz. Zaten LinkedIn üzerinden e, elektrobiosensin web sayfasına ulaşmanız mümkün. E, web sayfasında benim hem doğrudan mail adresim var hem de doğrudan telefon numaram var. E, dolayısıyla aslında bu konuda 
Ee, bize ulaşmak çok zor değil. Çok kolaylıkla arayabilirsiniz. Hatta bazen bazı müşterilerimiz e, özellikle yazılım konusunda çalışan e, ve bu tarz teknolojilere çok hakim olmayan müşterilerimiz doğrudan arıyorlar e, ve biz böyle bir yarım saatlik sohbetler ediyoruz. E, beraber proje geliştirdiğimiz firmalar oluyor. E, dolayısıyla çekinmeyin. E, beni doğrudan arayabilirsiniz. Ben bu tarz konularda zaten bir girişimcilik görüm de var. Aslında girişimciliklere, girişimcilere danışmanlık verdiğim ayrı bir e, konu da var, süreç de var. Dolayısıyla e, projenize, iş fikrinize ya da okulda yapacağınız master tezinize e, ya da akademisyenseniz e, ürünlerimizi daha detaylı anlayabilmek için Lütfen beni arayın. Dediğim gibi tekrardan kapatıyorum. LinkedIn üzerinden Selçuk Uğurlu beni takip edebilirsiniz. Web adresimiz www.electrobiosense.com Hepsi Türkçe kelimelerle, hiç arada elektro ile gibi değil, Türkçe karakterlerle bize ulaşabilirsiniz. So I just want to answer the one question that came through, which is... Um... The technology we've shown today is called a CGM, Continuous Glucose Monitoring. The question that came through was really about um, SMBG. SMBG stands for Self-Monitoring Blood Glucose. So we essentially have two different types of technologies, Continuous Glucose Monitoring and Self-Monitoring Blood Glucose, SMBG. So if you're interested in SMBG, where you take a drop of blood and you put it on a sensor and you get an immediate reading, then those kind of sensors are um, covered on our website. Uh, if you go into biosensors and um, glucose sensors, this, this page really talks about the types of technology where it's a glucose strip. That's an SMBG where you would test it with blood. And if you're interested in continuous glucose monitoring, um, CGM, which is the kind of next generation technology, um, then um you need to go to the cgm page because under there you're going to find micro needles you're going to find wearables you're going to find wire sensors um so you're going to find an awful lot of because the, there's different um form factors for different applications now what i want to say is if you're interested in biosensors and you want to learn more then just check out the developer zone that's one of um you can join us for free you can participate in webinars every Thursday at 8 a.m. Um, and as I say, there's also an academy, um, the ZP Academy, where you can um, log, log in and essentially get free training material on there. Now, I have to be, we, we thought we were going to do a webinar for 30 minutes. I went on too long. I apologize for that. And I have a meeting in three minutes. So I just want to say, you know, really appreciate Celsic. Um, for setting this up. And um, from our side, thank you. I, I really appreciate you guys um, joining us. I want Selsuk to have the last kind of, the last word on this, and then maybe we can um, wrap up. Okay, uh, thank you, Martin. Actually, thank you for your uh, presentation as well. It was very um, insightful, actually. Um, okay, this, will, this, is, this was the first webinar. I guess uh, there will be more uh, coming uh, next weeks, next months. So um, thank you for the webinar again. I guess we can say goodbye to our audience. Brilliant. All right. Well, thank you very much, guys. And we're going to stop now. But thank you for your attention. And if you like it, we'll, we'll do it again. All right. Thanks, Elsa. Very well done. Yeah. Have a nice day.